Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Rad Dad Podcast. I'm excited. Today, we have another first for the Rad Dad Podcast. We have our first virtual guest. So uh, we have Dr. Dan Ward on today. Uh, he reached out via Instagram, watched the the episode with with Christian's mother and, and co-parenting and said, hey, I'd, I'd like to be a guest. I want to talk about being a dad and some of my experiences and you know, I I love when people reach out because it just means there's there's a bigger following and there's more dads out there that are doing what what I try to do and and really grasping on to what I'm trying to accomplish with this podcast. So, Dan, welcome to the show. You know, introduce yourself, give us a little background about who you are, what you do, and you know who you are as a dad. Well, thank you. I, I am so excited, and I, I have to say, I, I really so I, I am um, friends with with Tiffany. And that's how I, how I even came into contact. And I just love what you're doing in terms of talking about dads and what it's like to be a dad, what it's like to be a professional and how we, how we manage our professional lives and how we manage our, our lives as a dad. And so I, I'm just really excited to be able to talk about it, to share some experiences. Um, in terms of me, I'm a facial plastic surgeon and an entrepreneur. I spent about 60% of my time doing uh, facial plastic surgery now, and the rest doing kind of running businesses. Um, businesses include, of course, my, the business of my practice, the business of the uh, the three med spas that we own, an operating room, and then primarily real estate. Although there may be a couple of other business purchases coming up in the next in 2023 that that might be kind of fun to um, to do, but not not enough that I can announce anything. But just in terms of finding balance and finding happiness and finding um, fulfillment is what um, I really am looking forward to to talking about with you and learning uh, from from you and your experiences. Yeah, thanks. That's that's a great recap of, of who you are, and I, I found everything interesting when we talked on the phone prior to this. And uh, yeah, it was it was a great episode with with Tiffany. And what's funny is we we actually put it into, you know, into pr practice. And so a lot of people can talk about stuff, but like we, we literally just got back this morning from New York city and it was something that we've always wanted to do. Both of us individually take our son to New York city for Christmas and have the whole New York city experience. And we came back early this morning because both Tiffany and I are, you know, get it done kind of people. And, you know, <laughs> really pivot on a dime if you have to. And, you know, we had our tickets for Rockefeller Center canceled without anyone telling us on Sunday. So we couldn't make it to our early skate session and then catch our flight in the evening. So we pivoted wow. like we always do, extended, found a hotel, got tickets for that evening, and then woke up early this morning. Uh, so we can make it back to Dallas for this podcast and the work. So it's it's you know it was great to have you reach out because one it means people are actually watching this podcast and I'm not wasting my time <laughs> but but two the message is getting across uh, and one of the things that really piqued my interest about you and and you know your experience as a, a dad was you gave the you, you told me the story of you know how you met your wife you you got married and then boom the kids came. And you didn't really get that honeymoon phase. So, so tell me about how you've worked through that with with your wife and your kids, and what it means to you to really work through that. Well, wow, um, yeah, there's a lot there to answer. Um, so, we did just a little bit of just to, so that your um, audience hears a little bit more. My wife and I kind of, I mean, it, it would be unfair to call it a whim. But in many ways, it kind of was. We we uh, went to high school together. Our best friends uh, dated in high school, and we were kind of thrown together. So we started to date. So we dated for a while, and right after high school, we were both going to be you know moving away, going to school, and we I won't sh share all the details, but we just decided to get married. And so like the summer after high school, we got married, and we've always like that decision is is maybe a little bit weird and a little bit extreme um i guess we kind of are a little bit weird a little extreme because that's kind of how we've been we've always been very sober minded and very um practical well let's just get it like why are we waiting you know let's just let's just do this this is what we want for our for our life in terms of the big picture like the fun will come later and we can we can get this all figured out so that's what we did and then shortly after like nine months after our uh, first uh, child was born and then two years later next one and then so on and so forth we've got four kids total and 
you know, it's weird now. I'm 46 now. It's weird being in a position where our, we, like the thing that we kind of told ourselves during all those hard years of medical school, of, I went to graduate school before medical school, college, everything. It's kind of there now. Like we, we told ourselves like, okay, this is going to be really hard right now. It's going to be very difficult for us to be able to, um, to, to do all these things being so young, having kids so young, being married so young, just trying to figure out us, let alone, you know, ourselves, let alone each other and our marriage and our uh, family. Um, but we kind of did it. Now we're kind of there and it kind of feels a little bit weird. It's almost like surreal. Like, wait, is this real? Like it really happened. And so it's a little bit different where a lot of our friends, you know, have, you know, kids that are, you know, less than 10 or maybe starting to be teenagers and we are nearly empty nesters. We've only got two years, a year and a half, I guess, now left with our youngest. And other than that, we'll be empty nesters. So it seems weird that we're kind of almost there. Yeah, it's it's funny how I always say life happens. And and you react to it either well or poorly. And you, know, you, you get to enjoy the fruits of your labor. So it's, it's all about, I, I've always said, you can't complain about the results you get with the work you didn't do. So, you know, one thing that really caught my eye with, with you is going through medical school. And, you, you know, you told me you were one of the, the oldest in your class. And, you know, because normally the process is, you know, you go to undergrad and then you go to med school, you're 22 years old, and then you go through, and you had to balance being a family man. And, and providing for your family. Tell me about that experience. Cause that's, that's interesting to me because not a lot, of, you don't hear about it a lot nowadays. Sure. I mean, it's, it's very much that kind of sober mindedness. I think that, you know, why we got married, it's the same sort of thing. Um, getting through school like that, it was tough. I mean, financially it was really tough. You, you can't really work in medical school. So um, it's tough to, to make ends meet. My wife had, her name is Janie, had always wanted to, she'd always felt very strongly that she wanted to stay at home and not work when the kids were young. So she thought we always kind of, both of us really valued that um, um, opportunity um, for, for her to be able to do that. Now, that having said that, it's, that doesn't mean she didn't do things to make ends meet. She did. She was like on this um, a housing um uh, leadership committee. So she, that, that helped us. I think we got half rent during that time because of the work she did to organize activities and stuff like that. She did all sorts of little things, um, but the family was always first. And I'm really grateful for the sacrifices that she made to, to do that. And that allowed me to really focus on being the best that I could be. You know, medical school is tough. It's, it's um, long and it requires a lot of hours. And, um, the cool thing about it for me was I think that having the family like I did, it probably helped me focus a little bit better and, and really say, you know, realize this, like what I'm learning matters. Like this matters both for me, for my future patients, of course, most importantly, but also for the livelihood of my family. And, you know, what, what sort of husband and father do I want to be, you know, like who do I want, what sort of doctor do I want to be? What sort of doctor do I want my wife to to, to be married to, or what sort of daughter do I want my kids to have as their dad? And it kind of really, I think, helped me take my studies maybe a little bit more seriously than what I would have otherwise. So I think it really helped me with focus, even though there were a lot of distractions in terms of trying to make ends meet and scrape and scrimp by. Sure. And the, the last guest I had on, Jorge, he, he talked about his wife staying at home as well. And you know, he, he put it in, a, in great terms of how much of an honor it was to him as, as a father. And he's like, she, my wife trusted me so much as a husband and a father that she allowed me to be the sole breadwinner. And he's wow. like, it's a lot of pressure. He's like, but she trusted me so much that I could do it. That is, that is really powerful. And, you know, I think that the, there's, you know, different things for different people and it's obviously a decision and things have changed. You know, it, our society has, has shifted from this, like, you know, role of of man being like this is what will happen you know which is totally inappropriate and totally not right in our in my opinion i'm sure most people's opinion um and and maybe the pendulum has swung and i think that i know that many times during that during that period my wife felt a little bit 
like maybe she knew, I think she, I hope she knew that I always valued her and the, what she was doing, but there were many instances where I think she felt that other people maybe didn't value like, Oh, you know, you're just a stay at home mom. You don't really do anything all day, which is, you know, I, I think it's, it's a lot of work, obviously, you know, anybody who's done it knows that's tough. I mean, leave me home for like a half day and I'm like going crazy. I can barely make it function. <laughs> it requires a lot of discipline, a lot of hard work and a skill set that is so, you know, so wide from, you know, anything from like bookkeeping to, to finance, to, to all the other things that, that come to running a house. And in fact, one thing that I think is, is interesting now that we've got our business, we've got just a little over 60 employees. One of the, one of the, um, the groups of people that we love when we get an application from a stay at home mom, that's now coming back to work. We love it because we know this person has got the opportunity to balance things. She can juggle things, figure things out. And so we really look, I know that our, our hiring team looks very carefully at the stay at home moms that are applying for jobs because they are so good at balancing things. I, <clears throat> I think that's wonderful because they're, they're often often overlooked. And like you said, they're fantastic multitaskers and they, they know how to handle definitely the ups and downs of a day having children at home. And you know, on top of that, they're eager to get back into the workforce. They're taking that step of I'm going to leave home on what I've done for four or five years and go back into the workforce and enjoy that and try to find myself again. Uh, I've seen that countless times with, with stay at home moms that went back, back to work and they've, they've enjoyed it and they enjoyed their time with their children at home, but it was time to, to go back and, and restart their careers. And I, I feel like, and I think the data shows that as well. It's, it's where a lot of the pay pay gap is with, with males and females is that time where women stay home or they don't have the opportunity to go back to work. Uh, so it's it's unfortunate, like you said, I, I agree with your statement of the old days of men saying what happens and when it happens and, you know, their their way or the highway is, you know, very outdated and it's it should be more of a partnership. It, it is a give and take and marriage and a relationship, co-parenting, whatever it is. And, you know, it, it's I think it's great that your your whole idea is central centralized around your family, like what kind of husband am I going to be to my wife? What kind of father am I going to be to my children? And yeah. how, how does that transfer into where you're at right now with, with your children being in college and want you know, being a year and a half away from being empty nesters? Well, you know, I think it kind of continues and I, and I hope I'm not portraying um, <laughs> myself in, in a, uh, too, too great of a light because I've made like every mistake along the way, both personally, business wise, professionally. And it's, you know, it, it's very humbling. And, and that's one of the things that I love about family. And I love about the opportunities is the, the, the opportunity, I guess, for forgiveness and for, for learning and for, for the opportunity to continue to grow together. Um, I've been really into this. You're probably familiar with this author, David uh, Data, D-E-I-D-A, who I've been really into his books lately. He wrote, he's got this book called The Way of the Superior Man, Intimate Communion, a bunch of things about relationships. And he's very much into like the masculine and feminine and how they kind of flow together. And he says about, you know, that, that about 80% of, of men have more masculine traits and, and whereas 20% is, is kind of feminine and, and vice versa for women. And I love that. I think that we are, when we just have this situation where it's, you know, traditional patriarchal sort of situation, we miss out on all of the great things that, that the feminine leaders and feminine thought provides us. And I, I just love this, this idea that we are partners in this, just like partners in a business. You know, if you're partners in the business, like I might be good at accounting, you might be good at marketing together. We make a really great team. And I just, I love that about a partnership in a marriage or, or how you work and how you function. And that's kind of how we continue. My wife is, she helped a lot with getting the business started and, and really is, it has been very critical in providing this valuable insight. She likes to say like, Hey, I am your ideal audience. Like ask me <laughs> what you should do. <laughs> and I, and I will tell you, and she's right. She is. She's like our perfect demographic, but she was very helpful with, with getting things running, but also like, it's, it's interesting. 
she has as you know as a feminine as 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 women women that have so many challenges that we as men don't even understand or unless we really think about it i was talking to her a few years ago about this and it's like oh my gosh i can open my eyes she she told me it's like hey when i go out at night when i leave the office at night and i go to the parking garage like i am constantly sur- looking around at my surroundings i'm constantly looking to see like is it safe and it's you know because men are you know because of the effects of testosterone and genetics just are stronger and let me let's face it we commit pretty much all the crimes all the violent crimes so they need to be they need to be on the lookout and she my wife made this really amazing point of stating that that she has noticed that she and i both approach business things a little bit differently she approaches it more like with caution she looks at it she tries to analyze like all the the different um standpoints Whereas she's noticed that I'm a little bit more just like, hey, let's just go do this. It, it'll be great. It'll be fun. Of course, you know, there's different personalities. It's not all male, female. But I really, going back to your question about like, how does that interplay with how we do things, like how we raise our kids, how we run businesses and stuff like that. I think it really is like she has this very kind of feminine approach that that I think as a society, we just miss out on if we are excluding that. And, you know, and I think also, you know, the masculine has has a role to play as well. I think it's such a beautiful interplay and just such a yin yang sort of come together and complementing each other. It's just beautiful. Yeah, it, it's great that you put it that way with your wife stating, "Hey, I have to look at my surroundings and and make sure no one's going to attack me." You know, I I look like someone that could be attacked, and <laughs> you know, that was that was the reason why one of the main reasons why. Tiffany and I agreed to go to New York together. She said, I would love to take Christian, but I would never take him alone. And she's like, it's too large of a city. You know, as petite as she is and Christian being small, she's like, we're an easy target. So, you know, having you there is great. You're you're a protector. You you will make sure we get everywhere on time. And, you know, it it was great to see that come together. And it's the same thing. We, We still have conversations. If I have a business question, she's the first person I go to. Uh, she's, she's a good person to ask. Yeah, she's a, she's a, <laughs> she, her, she's a brilliant business mind. And it's like she always says something I didn't think about. I'm like, oh, I didn't think about that. And to put it in your terms, she said she said the same thing several times. It's because you just do and then you figure everything out. She's like, I like to look at all the different pieces and, and then try to plan an attack. It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful just hearing different standpoints. And I think too often we focus on our differences and we miss out on the the similarities. But when there are differences, we might, we might, I know for for me, my natural inclination is to, is to complain about it. Um, Or like, why don't you do it this way? You know, I don't know if we're having a disagreement or something. And really over the last like six, 12 months, I've really tried to change my focus to just really being one of appreciation like appreciating that she does things differently or she handles this differently and then trying to learn from how she does it so that it helps kind of enrich my life and helps me be better. It's really powerful. No, yeah, that's great. I actually learned this from a really good friend of mine on his relationship with, with his wife. And I apply this to how I co-parent with, with Tiffany and our relationship. And then even now how I parent a little bit more with Christian when she's complaining to me about something at work. Mm -hmm. I now ask the question is, is this a listen situation or is it a help solve situation? And a majority of the time it's, I just need you to listen. I need to complain to somebody. And I've even taken that further with Christian. I'm like, Hey, what are you complaining about? Is this an issue that we need to solve or do you just need to complain? And it, it, helps resolve issues so much quicker instead of getting into an argument. Well, I don't need you to solve this for me. I just needed someone to to talk to. Isn't that so true? That seems to be a universal thing that I don't know why I have such a hard time learning that, but I get into that problem all the time where <laughs> I hear something and I instantly like want to fix it. And, you know, she'll say to me like, Hey, I, I no, I don't need to fix. It. I just need to talk. It's, I don't know why, but I think I, I've, I mean, I've read about this a lot. It seems to be kind of a universal thing that a lot of us as, as men kind of with those masculine traits, we seem to miss out on. Yeah. I think it's just the, you know, something broke around the house, we'd fix it. So we're you know, genetically predisposed to, I want I need to fix it. I need to fix this when they don't need you to fix it. And 
you know, most women nowadays are, are very independent and they can, they can resolve issues themselves. They need, just need to be heard. So it's, it's great to, to hear other men doing that and applying that, you know, in terms of being a father. And, and it's just another relationship is how I look at it with being a father. It's just, I'm raising a little man. So I treat him like a man. We have conversations like a man. I don't have a daughter, but I would treat her like a young woman and talk to her that way. And you have both boys and girls, right? Yeah, we got two of each. Two of each. And how do you, how does it differ with advice that you give or, or you know, how you've uh, punished them in the past for anything that they did wrong? Or you know, just like your wife said, you, how do you teach your daughter to look around for everything and be, be aware of her surroundings? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's such a great point. Cause I don't think any of us really have the perfect answer to that. So I think it's, I think it's really fun to be able to discuss that. So our, um, I've noticed something with, with my wife and me that we, I think that I may be a little bit harder on our boys and she's maybe a little bit harder on the girls. Um, <laughs> and, and what I mean by that is I kind of feel this like real responsibility for my boys. Like, Oh my gosh, like I need you guys to be like responsible men and, and grow up and thankfully both of their their ages uh 22 and uh 26 um so they're both doing great um at that and i think you know you, you never quite reach that perfect state of course but i'm feeling pretty good as a dad about those two just got lucky probably nothing that i did just lucky um but i think that i think i feel this pressure i think my wife feels the same thing like she really wants to make sure that she's passed on those kind of more feminine motherly sort of traits to to our daughters which you know I, I don't mean that in a sexist sort of way but i do i run into the same problem that we were just talking about with my daughters like they complain about something and i'm like well, well have you done this this or this and they don't really want it solved they don't need it solved they, they know it'll be okay but I, I just get so into like oh i just want to fix the problem and i don't want to maybe be patient and listen that's probably the biggest lesson that i still think that I need to learn. I mean, thankfully I'm recognizing that it's a problem. I still need to learn it though, is just being patient and listening, like not trying to, to be impatient. It's like, oh, well, let's just do A, B, and C, it'll be fixed. That's not the solution they need. The solution they need is, is just stopping and listening. And um, that's actually, for me, someone like me, that's actually very hard for me to do. I'm a very, you know, uh, go-getter organized. Like I just want to cross the tasks off my list. And and part of it is just like learning to, I guess, enjoy the journey and enjoy that process with all the, all the imperfections of life and all the things that can go wrong and recognizing the beauty that makes life, you know, because I'm really a strong believer in like the beauty between perfection and imperfection, the interplay is what makes life beautiful. The whole kind of Japanese concept of wabi-sabi, you know, the, the perfection of life, the beauty in life comes from the imperfection and mixed in with the perfect, perfect things. And I think that's, that's true. Like, I think that's one thing that I can better learn from, from, from women, you know, the women in my life is how do I, how can I deal with that imperfection or, or how can I better appreciate things and just learn to enjoy the journey a little bit more? No, and that's, it's beautiful that, that you appreciate that imbalance, that imperfection that, that we all have. And, you know, I, I it was years ago that I read about it, but I, I look at things the same way, especially when it comes to be being a father, being a co-parent, being a in business development, that imperfection. And I I take the the Japanese art of kintsugi of, you know, it's you know, bowls of clay or you know, old pottery. And if it's if there's a crack, they fill that crack with gold to highlight the imperfection and say that oh, hey, it's valuable. That even though it's cracked, it's so valuable, we filled it with gold. So now it looks beautiful. And it's some of the most beautiful art that I've seen. Where I'm like, I would buy that uh, if I had an extra 5K laying around for a little bowl. <laughs> so it's, that's great. And what's, what's even better to hear that from you is that you're a facial plastic surgeon. So a lot of people have the, the mindset of, oh, well, you're looking for imperfections so you can fix them. And you're like, no, it's, it's a balance of everything. And that's, that's just life. We all have imbalances. Uh, some people care about them so much, they, they take care of them. Uh, but it's, it's that balance. And it's, it's what I try to teach my son, because I still think it's important for boys to have a healthy body, body image. And instead of looking at themselves in the mirror and saying, 
I don't look like the guy in Muscle and Fitness magazine. I need a six pack. I need big arms and a big chest and I need to look perfect all the time. And it's not. We, we don't look perfect all the time. And it, it's teaching that to my son now so he has a healthy image or a healthy relationship with his body image. And it's I can only imagine it's 10 times more important on the female side. For sure. I appreciate you saying that because I um, I think that's true. I think we, we often talk about, uh, you know, body image with women, which is, of course, you know, very important. Um, it's, it's a very important thing to have positive body image. And um, but I think it does happen with men. In fact, I'm, I'm part of this little fitness group. I think it's on Facebook or something this where I saw this quote. It was supposed to be a joke, but it's actually kind of a sad commentary. It said something like, give a man a, a barbell and he'll lift for a day or something like that. Give a man body dysmorphia, he'll lift weights for the rest of his life. And, you know, they were trying to be funny with it, but I think that's true. I think we have this image of like masculinity of like be, almost like this over the top, like you got to be like Mr. Hunter with these bulging muscles and stuff like that. And that's not I think there's room within masculine behavior for, for that sort of thing. You know, this kind of extreme thing where you look like a, a Greek God or something like that, but there's also room for, you know, appreciation of the arts and appreciation for things that are maybe a little bit more, you know, I think we determine them, term them more on the feminine side, but, but that doesn't mean that you're not masculine or you don't have these kind of male traits. I think that's an important thing for our society to remember. Absolutely. And, and I say this as someone that grew up with body image issues. Like I was the guy reading all the muscle magazines. How do I work out? How do I look for, how do I get a six pack? How do I do this? And, you know, luckily I turned that into a healthy relationship with fitness. And it's why, why I still work out and I challenge my body to do different things. I, I think I told you, I learned how to ice skate a year ago. And, you know, last night we were skating at, on Rockefeller Center. So it, it was fantastic to learn something new. And I love just challenging my, my brain to learn something new. Uh, and it's, you know, with that, that balance of, of health and, and fitness, it's, it's tough sometimes. And, and like you said, you know, give them a barbell, they'll work out for a day. Give them body dysmorphia, they'll work out for the rest of their lives. And it's trying to find that good balance of that, that, that is difficult. I've, I've met some people that work out every single day. I, I don't get it. I need, I've got too much stuff to do to work out every single day. And like I said before, life happens. So, it, you know, for me, I, I think we talked about this on the phone before. I, I work to live. I don't live to work. It's, you know, I want to enjoy taking my son to New York, going to the beach, uh, and having the, the finances to do that, I have to work. And not just in this dead end job, working, 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 working. Um, how do you balance that? Owning, you know, multiple businesses, looking at real estate, and then even looking at twenty twenty three and maybe some potential investments. Um, I think it's tough. I mean, I think one of the biggest things is 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 making sure that you you stay disciplined with those things that are the most important to you. You know, so. I think it was Simon Sinek said some it used this analogy the first time I heard it. Um, I don't know if he came up with it or what, but he said, you know, like if you if your goal is to work out for 30 minutes a day, um, you know, each day of the week, you know, that's whatever, three and a half hours per per week that you're working out. If you put decide to put all three and a half hours in on Saturday morning, you're gonna get less of a result than if you just do 30 minutes seven days a week. You know, so so that that sort of thing I think is important where where we, we do those small things every day. And that's what, what I think is, is one, I personally feel that's a very um, powerful part of masculinity is like little small steps of discipline um, to help be better. So that's something that I try to instill in, in my sons. I, now, unfortunately, I've, I've kind of learned that I'm maybe a late bloomer. I've learned that a little later <laughs> than what I w- would have uh, wanted to. So I don't know if from a young age that I taught my kids that. But I think that helps you find balance. And, you know, for, for me, when I, I find balance, I need to get myself in the right state of frame every day. I'm a big um, fan of Tony Robbins and trying to follow you know, some of the things that he does with some of the priming things in the morning, doing some meditation, doing a little bit of prayer, doing some gratitude exercises helps me get my emotions in a state 
where I can be more successful. I can help my, you know, my kids or my business team, or I can help the leaders on the team be better at their job. And I think, you know, as a dad, you, you, it stops being about you and it starts being about your, your children. And, and in some ways, I mean, although employees aren't your children, you kind of feel the same sort of thing. Like your, your job is to really help them be the best that they can be. And how do we set them up for success? Not set you up for success. How do you set others up for success? And that is very much a fatherly sort of thing, I think, is how do we do that? And for me, it's all about a routine. And actually, in my little, I do this little five-minute journal thing every night, and it asks what I learned. So I did it Sunday night. That's what I learned the previous week. And the thing that I wrote was the importance of plan. A good day comes from a good morning, and a good morning comes from a good night. And so just getting that in, in step and in sync making sure that I do that. So number one, I can be there for my kids, but then also by example, kind of show that to them. No, that's, that's great. And I, I, I try to instill that with Christian all the time. And, you know, Tiffany's the same way. We, we talk about just getting the reps in, like you have to practice, you have to practice. If you don't practice, you're not going to get the results you want. So, you know, that's how I learned how to skate. I took three private lessons a week. I'm lucky my schedule allows me to do that to, to where I can be on the ice at 4 p.m. and skate before all the kids get there. Well, and how cool is that, though, that you've created that? Like, I think for so many of us is like none of us as dads or whatever or as husbands, like none of us goes down the path of like, oh, my gosh, like, yeah, you know what? I want to be like a C minus sort of dad. I wanted to be, you know, I think just that like the fact that you arrange that with your busy, busy schedule, like you created that. How cool is that? And how what a cool lesson for Christian to see like his dad wanted to do something. He created time in his schedule to do it. I think that is so powerful and so cool. It's a s- small example, but amazing. No, and and I would agree with you. And gosh, it was several months ago when Christian was complaining about something in hockey and Tiffany looked at him and said, how many dads would learn how to ice skate and learn how to play hockey you have a great dad. And she's like, look at all the other dads. They're on the sidelines. They're watching. Your dad's coaching, and now he plays on two teams. And I, wow. I, was, like, I was like, uh, I have an obsessive personality, so I can't help it. <laughs> but to your point, uh, we shouldn't want to be mediocre dads. That's That's the point of this podcast is if you had a mediocre dad, that doesn't mean – you have to be one. If you didn't have a dad at all, that doesn't mean you have to be an absentee father. Learn from their mistakes and do the opposite. I'm like you. I've made a a million mistakes in my life and failed more than I've succeeded. And I've told Christian that tons of times that, hey, I'm successful because I failed so much, but I learned from those mistakes. Please learn from my mistakes so you don't have to make the same mistakes and you can be on a quicker path to success. Yes, absolutely. I love that. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's one of the things that we can provide as fathers um, to our children is opportunities for failure. Um, You, you, you may have heard this, um, the founder of, of Spanx, you know, the, the clothing line. Um, I heard her, I have heard her say that a few times, she's an amazing entrepreneur, an amazing person. But she said one of the one of the things that that allowed her to persist in creating this company when nobody wanted to listen to it, nobody wanted to hear her, nobody wanted to see her, was her dad. I guess once a week would like I don't know if it was like Sunday dinner or something, but he would talk to her and her brother, and he would say, "What did you fail at this week?" Which is kind of an interesting way to word it. But hmm. she said what that provided was number one that it was okay to fail. Like, and in fact, it's, it's kind of expected for you to fail. And number two, if you're not failing, it means you're not trying hard enough. You're not working to exceed and do that. And, you know, whether it's sports, whether it is, you know, just like little activities, whether it's helping with chores around the yard, whether it's challenging our children, I think sometimes we lose that. And I actually, I actually went through a period of time where I had a hard time with sports for my kids because I, I kind of, I hate to be judgmental of anyone, but I kind of found myself judging some of the other parents because it's almost like they were trying to live their life through their kids and not maybe realize like your child's probably not going to be this sports prodigy that's, you know, the next LeBron James, like just enjoy the fact that they missed the shot. Just enjoy the fact that they didn't run as fast as they could to first base or they struck out or whatever. Like 
That is the real thing that you're trying to learn in sports, for example, is how do you fail and how do you just keep going anyway? I think it's so powerful. No, no, that's great. And if if you love the Spank story, you'll you'll love the book that her husband wrote called Living with the Seal. And he was, you know, successful entrepreneur. He was an MTV VJ and then started a, a charter jet company, sold it, made millions of dollars, met, I believe Sarah is her name that started yeah. Spanx, met Sarah. And then they got married and they had kids and they're doing great and they're balancing their lives of both being successful business people. And then he goes off and decides to hire a Navy SEAL to live with him for 30 days because he feels like he has no discipline. And he's like, I want to get in shape. I want to do this. And just the stuff that he learned from that SEAL SEAL living with him was it was phenomenal. And, and to hear the story on how Sarah balanced it and the family balanced it, and the seal would come with them to their winter home and hang out with them and he would work out and like to hear how they just worked as a unit to, you know, to basically say, yeah, dad's gone crazy and he hired the same seal to live with us. Let's support dad and let him do this. And he talked about going running in the cold and, you know, Every single day, they did it. They ran. They ran. They ran. They ran. And he was able to accomplish his goal at the end of the book. And he's like, it just taught me how important failing was. And you know, I'd been so successful as an MTV VJ and other things. And he talked about being being a rapper. And he, he said the same thing. He's like, I failed so many times until someone did listen to my tape and did think I was a good rapper, and they hired me for other things, and then that's how I got into MTV, and then I had money to do the jet thing, and it's great to hear story. I've never heard that story about Sarah and her dad asking her what, what she failed at every week because that it's important that we do fail at something. And I, I say you should learn something new every year. You should learn how to fail at something. Now I w- kind of want to fail at something every week. I hope it's just not a big thing. <laughs> <laughs> totally, totally. That, that that's crazy. That that story. Um, I don't know if you know that the Marine David Goggins. Yeah, it's David Goggins. The, yeah. And I mean that guy is so crazy. His book um, is so good. It's so inspiring. It's actually like for our employees, we do a book of the month, and it's like a book club for for our team. And uh, we did that. <laughs> it was, I, I had forgotten how much. Um, uh, foul language was it was in the book so maybe not recommended for your employees i was a little bit embarrassed that we'd recommended it but what a powerful story and this the story that jesse tells about him living there is just i mean over the top hilarious but i, I actually wanted to kind of ask you something about a, a feeling that i have and that is like how do we i think as dads like historically like traditional masculine sort of father fathering is um you know, maybe, maybe being really tough on our boys or our kids, mm-hmm. you know, like, like, no, there's no room for error. Like you do this or, you know, do this right. Or you do your hundred pull-ups or you, you know, mow the lawn perfectly, whatever chore there is or whatever, and you're going to do it right. And that's like the masculine way to do it, which I think is important. That's like one of the things that, you know, I think Goggins went through with, uh, when that story that you were telling with the, you know, living with the Marine, um, you know, how do we, how do we do that? How do we kind of provide that sort of um, structure for our for children, but also let them feel loved? Because I think that's really the problem with with a lot of you know overly masculine patriarchal sort of situations is that we we maybe lose sight of how important it is that despite the the fact that maybe we are presenting some hard challenges for our for our sure. children. How do we make them know that we love them? It's something I've struggled with in, in the past, and I've really had to work on it to to do that. Uh, I'm Type A, Tiffany is Type A, so we we both have very high standards, and we're just we have that old school mindset of just get it done, like suck it up and get it done. And we this is not a bad thing. We have a, a very emotional son. And he wears his, his heart on his sleeve and coaching him in hockey and, and everything else. It, yes, it is frustrating when 
I don't feel like he gives 100% effort uh, on the ice because I, I always do, and I just learned how to skate. He, he has four years on me. So it, it's especially a kid that grew up playing sports, and I, my goal every year was to make the all-star team. And then in high school, make varsity. I was a varsity wrestler in high school. And it's just that get it done mindset, work, work, work. Unfortunately, he doesn't have that yet. Could he develop it? Yes. And what I've had to do, especially in a sports setting, is before remind him that no matter what his performance is like on the ice, I'm proud of him and I love him. And that even non-sports related, there's nothing he can do to make me not love him and not be proud of him. So he's, you know, he's already set. So just give it your best is, is my recommendation for him. If you can come off that ice or get out of a test and say, I tried my hardest and I prepared the most and hardest that I could, I'll, I'll never, you know, be mad at you. But for me, the the extra for that was, I know if he tries his hardest and he worked his butt off, he'll never be disappointed in himself. And <clears throat> I believe, oh, I saw that you are a uh, amateur presidential historian, and I, <laughs> I think the story is with President Carter. He was he had le already left office. And he was meeting with a general, and a general, you know, was talking to him, and they were talking about what he accomplished and what he didn't. And the general asked him, "Well, did you did you try your hardest? Like you went to Harvard, you went to law school, you did this, you, you became president." And uh, actually, he didn't go to Harvard; he went to the Naval Academy, I believe. And he's like, "Did you try your best at everything?" And he was honest and said, "No." I probably could have tried a little bit harder in college. I probably could have tried a little bit harder being an attorney. Uh, he's like, so go go work work at everything 100%. So when you're done with it, you could say, I tried my best. I have no regrets. And that's what I try to instill to Christian. And that's, that's what I would hope more men do as well. Like, hey, I'm already proud of you. Just go out there and try your best. And if you if you can say you tried your best, because you're the only one that can gauge that, then you shouldn't be disappointed in any result. That is so powerful. Yeah. I'm familiar with that biography you're talking about with Carter. <laughs> it's, yeah. You know, the title is like his very best. It's a great title, his very best. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's what I say to my kids is, Hey, listen, no matter what you do, you know, just try your best. And I think part of it though, is, is, um, is their identity? Like what identity to do our kids have of themselves? Like, you know, does Christian feel like he's, is he a hockey player? Like, is that part of the mental image and the identity that he has for himself? If so, then, you know, it's almost like the rest will take care of itself versus, you know, versus other things. If I'm a big believer that if a child believes they're a bad student, they will be. It's kind of like that old Henry Ford quote or um, that says, says something along the lines of whether you can or can't, you're probably right. Um, I remember that one. It's, I, I just love that message. And, and it reminds me of, um, I'm a big uh, fan of This American Life with Ira Glass. And a number of years ago, they had um, an economist on, from University of Chicago economist. And I guess, I, I don't remember the exact details. I might get some of these wrong. But as I remember it, this, this economist found out about like, high, he knew about high school degrees, of course, but he found out about the GED program. He's like, wait, what? Like we can... I don't know how long the GE programs were, but it's like, we can do a whole four year curriculum in like six weeks. Like, why are we wasting all this time with, <laughs> with high school? When we could get people done in, in six weeks and have them go out of the workforce. This is great. Like we should do this everywhere. So he went on this research path where he looked at, um, he compared GED recipients versus high school diploma recipients. And what he found is that almost without exception, I mean, on average, for sure, if you look at the two groups, the, the high school diploma people did better in almost every measure of life, despite the fact they had the same ac academic knowledge and, and all this other stuff, you know, same demonstrated um, academics. 
the point that like the conclusion they reached after years of, of research was that that the extra work they did, you know, whereas it was with socializing, it was with you know, some of the extracurricular events, is learning to work in small groups really benefited these students so that they could have the skills, the non-academic skills for achievement, which is kind of interesting. But then the follow-up to that was they started to do research looking at like what actually made a good student or what made a bad student. And after all that conclusion, they came to, after all that research, they came to the conclusion that it is what the image that that the student has of themselves. If the student thinks they're good at math, they will be good at math. They may struggle with it more than, than you know, the student sitting next to them. If they think that they're good at, at English, they will be. Um, and that's what it all comes down to. And I think that's the, the other concept that I feel so strongly with this is that it backs up this, this amazing book by a plastic surgeon, Dr. Maltz, called Psycho-Cybernetics, where it really talks about how our self-image becomes everything. Like what we believe about ourselves is what happens. So I think as fathers, we need to remember that, that, that the image we help create, that we have these vulnerable minds, these, these young, you know, in my opinion, my belief, you know, children of God, that, that, that we are entrusted with taking care of and providing for them. And that we, our, our job is to help mold them and, and believing that they can do what they want to, to do and, and accomplish what they want to do. I just think that is such a powerful thing for us to remember. And that no matter, you know, whether we are, um, you know, providing encouragement that's positive or providing encouragement that's more on the negative side, because there's pluses and minuses to each, that we need to keep that in mind, that our that our main job is to kind of create this self-image of our children that allows them to have the tools and the foundation they can build on to be successful in whatever they choose to pursue in life. No, and that that's a great way to put it with what you said about being a the child of God. And and we talk about, you know, God at our, our house constantly. We pray every night. And God built each and every one of us to be unique in our own way, with our own characteristics, which is kind of uh, hypocritical to a quote that I have written on my wall, but it's totally some separate. And th- that other quote is, you're not special, do the work. So <clears throat> it, it's, it was one of the things that really resonated with me on, you know, I, I grew up Catholic, I was raised Catholic, and uh Basically, I felt like I was taught to pray everything away. <clears throat> and mm. the reason I made a switch to just non-denominational was I started to hear pastors and leaders of church talk about work and how important working toward a goal was. So yes, prayer is important, but it's just it's just words if you don't put the work behind it to get there. Like God's not going to make it pop out of nowhere and happen. Uh, in that case, you know, everybody would win the lottery that pr- prayed for the lottery and everyone would be good looking. So, <laughs> it, you know, it, it's great to teach Christian that, that, hey, if you don't want to play hockey, you don't have to. If you don't feel like that's part of, of what you want to do. And, you, you know, fortunately for, for me, he likes it. But like you said, if that's not his characteristic, and we all have our own little quirks. And one of the, uh, well, it won't be such a secret now that I'm saying it on the podcast, but one of my favorite things about Christmas is I absolutely love the Nutcracker Ballet. Like to to me the like to see the athleticism and the finesse happening on stage and then the story that's being told, it's phenomenal to me. And some people would say, "Oh, well that's a very feminine thing to like." And I'm like, "No, it's actually very masculine. <laughs> like look look at what these people are accomplishing and they worked so hard to to do that." And you know, we were able this weekend to to take in a Harry Potter play on Broadway and watch the Rockettes. And I was explaining to the Christian on you know the, on the Rockettes. I was like, "Do you know why that this is impressive?" And he's like, "No." I was like, "The amount of work they've had to put into just practicing timing, their body being able to, to pull off those movements." I was like, "It's phenomenal." It, we're watching an athletic event, but we don't know it. And, you know, those women wanted to be Rockettes. They, you know, they probably grew up saying, I want to be a Rockette. And yeah. there's you know, all the actors on Broadway grow up saying they want to be an actor. And it, it takes work. We can't just, can't just prey on it or say, hey, I want to be an actor, so I'll be one. And, you know, to, to couple those together, I think is, is very important. And, you know, I, I like that you touched on, you know, God and faith, because I think we don't talk about it enough anymore. 
we're too afraid of being canceled or, or being pushed aside. And I've heard more men talk about it on this podcast and, than any other time. And I think it's great because we, we need that spiritual connection, no matter what your religion is, uh, to really help guide us. And I think that guides us as, as men and as fathers to help have a blueprint to follow. Oh, without question. And I think that, um, yeah, whatever your belief system is, I mean, I think that I personally feel that 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 belief in the higher power um, is such an important part. And, and you know, and no, none of us really knows, you know, speaking of faith, no, none of us really knows. A lot of it is what we just decide that we want to believe and what we want to to have in our life. And, and, and based on what we decide to believe, how we want to to have that change our life and affect our life. You know, um, I, I think that's a, such a powerful part. And I, I agree with you. I think that it's it's kind of scary to to talk about religion because people might feel that you're trying to push your religion onto them, which I hope I never feel like that with people. But just, you know, it's almost like I just want to share something that gives me strength and gives me hope and gives me comfort in times when I need it. So it's not to try to, you know, talk people into into my religion or my way of thinking, but just to share the comfort that I get from it. So I hope that's how it comes across. I hope that's how it comes across to my kids. No, and I think I think it's important, and Christian sees the the value in different cultures and different belief systems too. Because when we, when we first moved into our house over a year ago, I think sixty five percent of our neighborhood are Indian, mm-hmm. and I asked a friend of mine, "Hey, I saw decorations on the outside, and they were having a huge party. Is that a thing?" They're like, mm-hmm. yes, it's a thing in the Hindu religion. This here's what's going to happen, and I asked what is the the proper gift to give them as their neighbor she's like oh give them sweets like buy them a cake and give them a cake or cookies that's that's totally mm-hmm. on on board so i did that literally the next day they came to my door and reciprocated and they're like hey we bought some sweets for your son and you know here's here's a bottle of wine we don't know what you drink but here you go uh, i just thought this is how you build community. Like even though we we have totally separate you know belief systems, you know we're just being nice. We're 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 just being people. you know cordial to people. We're saying, hey, I respect whatever your religion is, but at the end of the day, you're my neighbor. You're a young couple. You have a kid on the way. If there's anything I can ever do, let me know. It's beautiful, isn't it? So it's little simple acts that make life worth living and make it just this is just enriches it and provides that richness and texture that we need. I, I, I just love the, I love those little stories like that. It's so beautiful. Yeah. And, and I'm lucky I live in a great neighborhood where stuff like that happens. And it, it was, I don't know what their belief system is with Halloween, but I know a lot of people don't celebrate it. And it was great to see everybody just getting into the community and getting into the Halloween <laughs> spirit, if that is a thing and doing that. And saying, "Hey, here, like, we're handing out candy. We know that's what people do here. So let's let's just accept it and and jump in because it's a community thing." Yeah, I think that's so cool too. You know, just being a dad and and being being able to, I think, too often we're maybe scared to reach across you know, re- religious or cultural barriers, and just you know, being being willing to make the mistake of like putting yourself out there and like, Hey, I don't know if this is the right thing to take to you. You know, th- if this suite is the right thing to take or, or whatever, I hope I'm not doing something wrong, but just like, I guess I'm just saying like the gesture and having your children see that, like having Christians see that you did that is so cool. I think. And I think it's, I think you're right. You said it's how you build a community. It's so true. And I think it's so important. I think that's something that's really, I really wonder what's going to happen with our society with, so much things being online where we're not interacting with each other. In fact, I kind of wonder with some of the, you know, as you mentioned, I am a little bit of a presidential historian, like extremism and polarity in politics has been around for, since before Washington's time. So it's, it's not new, Absolutely. but we seem to have like an extra extreme thing where, where, you know, like if you, if you like one side, you're evil. If you like the other side, you're extra evil. I, it's just, is just this crazy thing. And I think it comes about maybe because we, we can be a little bit more selective about the tribes that we choose to be part of, you know, versus, you know, you or I may have completely different political views, but if we're neighbors and we help each other and, you know, I 
I push the snow off your driveway when I have extra time or, and you do it to me, like, it doesn't matter. Like we, we understand that we can have these difference differences in opinion without it affecting who we are or the love that we have for each other. And I feel like with, you know, Facebook or social media or online stuff, we can really segregate ourselves where we only hear that echo chamber of our own thoughts. And I, I feel like as parents, if we can expose our children to other cultures, other viewpoints, other ideas, it allows our kids to kind of grow. And I, I think it's missing in our society. Yeah, I, I would agree with you on that 100%. I, and the good thing is I see the opposite in, in Christian's school. We, he goes to a STEM school. So one, he has a different choice of science, technology, engineering, and math, which, which I love. But he also loves art. He loves comic books. He has a creative mind. He wants to be a writer and develop this stuff. I don't have that brain. Uh, <laughs> but you know, both Tiffany and I talk about, well, whatever you're going to do, we'll help you turn it into a business because we don't <laughs> want you to be a starving artist. We, we, we won't pay for our art history degree. <laughs> so you know, let's put some business in there. And yeah. <laughs> he loves it. He, he, every time we talk to him about what career he wants, it's, you know, I want to be an engineer. I, then I want to be a comic book writer. Then I want to join the military. And he'll, he'll realize that he won't be able to do all of it. And he'll have to narrow it down to a few things. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's very refreshing to, to hear him say that, that he has all these different interests instead of just, you know, dialing in on, on one specific career and, and making it a, you know, all or nothing kind of deal. Uh, because I've, like you said, I've failed at many things in life. And, you know, did I ever see myself working in business development within healthcare? Absolutely not. If you would ask me what I wanted to be when I grew up, I would have told you an attorney. And <laughs> I am the absolute opposite of that. Yeah. You know, you know, you never know which direction that life's taking you. You just have to be, I guess, have that faith that, that God or the universe is, is taking you the direction that you need to go. Um, and that's, that can be humbling. It requires a lot of faith. <laughs> well, I know we're coming up on time and I like to end the podcast with what's the one thing you want your kids to know? Oh, wow. One thing to let the kids know. Um, I want them to know, to know that I love them. And no matter like kind of what you said with Christian, like when he, you know, when he goes out on that ice, you just want him to know that he's loved, that he's cared for no matter what happens, whether he wins, fails, whatever, um, that that you love him. And that's what I want to say to my kids. I just want them to to know that they're loved. That uh, yeah, that's beautiful. And it's it's refreshing to hear more fathers say that. That I just want them to know that I'm loved and and no matter what they do, what they accomplish, you're, you're loved and, and you can't really fail in my eyes. But Dan, thank you again for, for joining today. I appreciate it. Like, like I said on the phone, I have to make it out to Salt Lake because I've never skied or snowboarded before. So uh, we'll have to do that and, and you'll have to teach me a little bit about how to do it. Yes. And come skate at the Olympic Oval from the, from the Olympics. Oh, yeah. We'll go, we'll go out there. For sure. <laughs> well, take care. Thank you. Say hi to Tiffany. Um, happy holidays to you and your family. And thanks for thanks for having me on. It's been really fun. I appreciate it. Yeah, same to you. Have a great day.